Committee looked at security issues at the U.S. Capitol since September 11th. Members heard from the architect of the Capitol, the clerk of the House, and the House Sergeant at Arms. Ohio Congressman Bob Ney chairs this hour 40 minute hearing. The committee will come to order. Uh, today, the Committee on House Administration is holding an oversight hearing on the progress and direction of capital security, emergency preparedness, and infrastructure upgrades in the U.S. House of Representatives sep since September 11, 2001. I'd also like to note, please, if you uh, could turn off uh, uh, or put on silent uh, cell phones and Blackberries and other electronic uh, devices. I also want to thank the House Recording Studio for uh, setting up the uh, internal uh, distribution of this through the House system today. As we open today, I first want to thank all of our witnesses uh, for being here. I know this is a very busy time for uh, everyone. I also want to thank our audience for their interest as well. Ultimately, security emergency preparedness depends on the vigilance and cooperation of everyone who serves, works, or visits here to the nation's capital. The purpose of this hearing today is to step back a moment from the hurried pace that we've all been proceeding under this past year to address the new security realities and the way the systems operate here in the U.S. Capitol uh, since September the 11th, 2001, and to take measure of how far we've come and where we want to focus our time and resources as we move forward beyond the first anniversary of that uh, terrible day for our nation. We should all take a great deal of pride in what uh, we have collectively accomplished, uh, everybody involved, all the staffs, the officers, uh, staff on a bipartisan base of U.S. House, and I especially want to thank uh, this committee, uh, our ranking member, uh, Steny Hoyer, uh, all of the members, uh, Republican and Democrat of this committee, who in not one single instance since 9 -1 -1 has injected one bit of politics in this. Uh, when decisions had to be made, it was done on a bipartisan cooperative basis, and I appreciate that, and I know the nation does, in order to keep uh, the people's house in operation. So we should have a, a great pride in uh, what we have accomplished. Uh, again, everybody in attendance here today, but the dedicated staff who, uh, behind the scenes, also have done the work, and all of our professional working men and women, uh, the uh, officers of the House, their staff, uh, obviously, all, including Capitol Hill Police. Uh, the human tragedy that unfolded on September 11th stirred a tremendous collective resolve amongst uh, all Americans. It's with this determined resolve that the committee and the witnesses before us have marshaled their efforts. Make no mistake, we've uh, had a lot of hard work ahead of us, uh, and we are going to, as we continue, to ensure that the House of Representatives remains the people's house, an open house, but ultimately it must be a secure house. Protecting the Capitol from the threats that face us in this post-911 world has been and must continue to be the highest priority. Let us also not forget that the attacks did not end for us on September the 11th, but continued the following month with the attacks of anthrax through the mail system, forcing the evacuation and relocation of the entire campus. Continuity of government and disaster recovery no longer were concepts to plan for in the future, but were the realities with which we faced uh, for so many trying days last fall. I should also note there was a working group put together the very next day after 911 and involved uh, officers of the House, the staff, House Administration Appropriation, uh, the leaders, uh, Speaker Hastert's office, Leader Gephardt, and that was a good working group that's had an ongoing process as we speak today. Uh, as a result, however, I'm convinced that we have shown the world that we are resilient and more focused than ever to meet uh, any challenge. We're stronger, safer, wiser, and even more determined than before to secure our capital as an open venue forever to conduct the people's business. The Committee on House Administration's oversight role includes physical security, information security, and emergency preparedness for the House and Capitol complex as well as the oversight and coordination of the House officers as they perform their duties related uh, to these issues. The committee has been actively and consistently engaged in new security measures and the approval of security-related devices installed in the Capitol buildings and the surrounding House office buildings. Uh, the committee's efforts have focused attention on life, safety, emergency preparedness, and capital security. As part of these efforts, we've deployed and explored new technologies and accelerated efforts to ensure the continuity of legislative and constituent service operations. In its oversight ca uh, capacity, the Committee on House Administration has worked closely in planning and coordinating the efforts of the Sergeant of Arms, Chief Administrative Officer, and the Clerk of the House on all these priorities. I look forward to hearing from each of our witnesses today from their perspective as how far we have come over the last 12 months, receiving an update on uh, where they feel we stand today and what we see as the challenges they face in their capacity as we move forward into the next year and beyond. 
Campus security, emergency preparedness, and disaster recovery are all evolving objectives, works in progress, and with each passing day are hopefully more completely realized, but with the understanding that we will never meet a day where we can say that we're going to be finished. This is why all of us have been forced to think outside the box that we have become so comfortable with and operating within, and have had to think in new and creative ways to address the challenges with which we're faced. Toward that end, I'm convinced that we must take a thorough look at the way we manage and meet uh, all of our needs. There's no question, too, and I want to just mention parking for a second. Most of our requests uh, come in the area of parking a lot. But I think there's also no question that the underground parking facilities and the house office buildings, although convenient, pose some, some serious challenges. I think it's time to look seriously at options with which uh, we could allow the construction of alternative parking facilities to replace the underground parking. Ultimately, that would allow for the use of space within our office buildings, which uh, were currently pretty well squeezed. These buildings were designed uh, years ago, and I think we could uh, more efficiently uh, utilize that space for uh, needs that benefit uh, the campus in general. Uh, the committee will be taking action to direct the House officers to report back to the committee with a comprehensive plan to study the associated actions inherent to such a review and supply the committee for consideration. I'd also encourage the architect of the Capitol to include uh, such a discussion in their master planning process as they assess the long-term needs of the Capitol. I won't spend any more time on the, on the point uh, expanding on my ideas and concerns, as I'm sure we'll have a great deal to say, but I welcome any comments the witnesses may have on these or any other relevant uh, concerns. Additionally, as you know, uh, you can all recall last fall I convened a working group comprised of the House officers, the architect, the Capitol Police representatives from House Leadership and Appropriations Committee, I mentioned it earlier, to work together to identify objectives and focus solutions in response to the attacks. And that working group worked, I think, in a very effective way to address the immediate uh, short-term concerns and to have long-term planning. And uh, you might want to pro uh, comment on the progress of, of that uh, arrangement, because I think it, it worked uh, quite well. I also want to talk about, uh, just for a second, the expectations in the format of today's hearing. Due to the nature of today's subject matter, I've decided that it's appropriate to conduct the first part of the hearing in open format, but for the second portion of our hearing, uh, I would entertain a motion to close the meeting and proceed in executive session in order to give the members and the witnesses here today an opportunity to ask and answer as candidly as they can certain questions which involve sensitive law enforcement information. As such, I would ask for the understanding and cooperation of the press and all others in attendance uh, in the audience at that time. Further, I would ask our members and witnesses to be mindful in the first portion of our hearing to reserve any comments or questions with respect to any specific uh, process or procedure which may involve uh, sensitive law enforcement information. So if a question is asked and you feel it's sensitive, just, of course, feel free to, to speak up on that. I want to also point out, I'm, uh, historically, in, in my time in public office, I've always supported you know, an, an open system, but there are certain things I think would uh, hurt uh, all the visitors of the Capitol, the media, the staff, and everyone if, in fact, they were discussed in, uh, in open venue, and I think that's, that's pretty well understood. Um, also, I'd like to, you know, proceed uh, in a second here uh, to ask our ranking member and any other members uh, if they'd like to make an opening statement. But just, again, let me just say that the purpose of this hearing is to, you know, show the amount of, of progress we have made to discuss the ideas that are out there. Uh, we have had, I think, uh, a tremendous staff, uh, and that includes the, the House, personal officers, the committee, officers of the House, that uh, also underwent uh, quite a trauma uh, here in the nation's capital. And they all chipped in, and they all kept uh, the People's House going, and I think that they need uh, tremendous credit for that. And again, I just appreciate ranking member, Congressman uh, Ehlers, and all the other members of this committee who just did a tremendous job in the last year of working. I commend the officers of the House and their staff uh, they have uh, made it a, a charge every single day to keep uh, the People's House open to the people and to keep uh, this capital running, and I commend you for it. And with that, I'd like to turn to our ranking member, uh, Mr. Hoyer of Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. On Friday, the members of the House and Senate and many staff uh, went to Federal Hall in New York, where 211 years ago, uh, this Congress met. We have a great pride on the fact that uh, this Congress is the oldest continuous uh, democratic body in the world. Um, on September 11th uh, of last year, terrorists struck at us to both make a point and try to undermine uh, 
that way of life and that nation in that respect they failed obviously they succeeded in changing our lives they succeeded in costing us uh, a lot of resources but they did not succeed in their basic objective i first want to thank bob nay uh, this committee is a, a pleasure to serve on it's a pleasure to serve on because bob nay runs this committee in a bipartisan, open fashion so that every member has input and every member feels that their views are taken into consideration. In particular, as the ranking member, I find uh, Chairman Ney to be someone with whom uh, I have forged uh, not only a very positive working relationship but a deep friendship as well. His leadership of this committee post-September 11th, I think, was important for this institution and important for this country, and I congratulate him on that leadership. Uh, we're here today to review the many initiatives which the committee, uh, the Capitol Police, and the security support staff of the House have undertaken to ensure safety and facilitate communications in times of emergency. Uh, immediately after September 11th, a large number of our staff performed extraordinary service to the House. Uh, while it was not necessary for us to meet off campus, if you will, uh, our staff working round the clock after September 11th had ensured that we had that ability if we were required to do so. And we'd all thank them for not only the great talent that they have, but their patriotism and willingness to go far beyond the call of duty to serve their country and to serve this Congress. We're here today to renew everyone's understanding that members uh, obviously bear the ultimate responsibility of what this institution does uh, and the policies it adopts and the security measures that it installs. We're responsible for that as members, but we look to our staff to carry out policies. So we're here today to again review and consider the unfolding security initiatives in the wake of September 11th. The barbarism of that day will not diminish our resolve to address uh, this Congress's, this country's, and the world's evolving needs and concerns. While the culprits and their accomplices are rooted out and brought to justice, the Congress will continue its important work in furtherance of a nation and a world based on democracy, tolerance, and mutual respect. It is our solemn duty to ensure that terrorism never triumphs over freedom. Our hearing today will highlight some of the things which we have done and are doing to ensure that terrorism has no place to strike and no place in a civilized world. We will do what we can and what we must and will not be deterred by the threats of terrorists. It is fitting today as we reflect on the events of a year ago and the actions we have taken in the interim that we conduct the business of this institution, Mr. Chairman, as you have said, in public to the greatest extent practicable and in a manner consistent with the increased security concerns of our experts. I might say in passing, I think all of us are concerned uh, with the fact that the Capitol looks uh, a little different, uh, a little less open, a little less hospitable to those who own this Capitol uh, and who glory uh, in its role that it plays in their country. However, we are accommodating reality not only to protect these buildings, but uh, also to protect the people who come to this building to participate uh, in democracy here in their capital. Some information, obviously, as the chairman has pointed out, we're going to have to take in executive session, uh, not to preclude the American public, but to preclude those from having information which might facilitate their evil work. So, Mr. Chairman, I congratulate you. If there's a message in the today's hearing, 
it is that terrorism will not succeed in changing, diluting, or diminishing mankind's inevitable movement toward individual freedom and liberty, the very foundation of this nation. I thank you for convening this hearing, and uh, I will reiterate it at the end, but I say at the beginning to all of you who represent the thousands of people who have worked so diligently, so selflessly, so effectively since September 11th to ensure the integrity of our democracy and the safety of this hill and of the people who visit and work here. Uh, we thank them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the ranking member for his thoughtful comments. We'll turn to Mr. Ayers, uh, who's been a diligent member of this committee and also is our uh, quasi-scientific and technology advisor. <laughs> well, that's correct, except for the quasi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for calling this uh, hearing. I think it's uh, certainly essential that we do this and review what has happened in the past year. I do not have a formal opening statement, but I also want to express my appreciation to the staff. It's, uh, it's been a tough year, very tough year on all of us. And I suspect none of us have worked as hard as we have this past year because not only dealing with terrorism and the terrorist acts and increasing security and all the things that this committee is concerned about, but every committee has dealt with legislative initi initiatives necessary to deal with terrorism, the dangers we face, and our response to them. And that continues to this day and will likely continue for some time. It's been a very busy, extremely stressful year for many, many people, and I express my my thanks to everyone in this institution who has worked so hard to, to accomplish what we have accomplished. I look forward to the testimony. Uh, obviously, we have not done as well as we could in many of the things that we tried to do. And it's important for us to pinpoint those, not in the sense of seeking retribution or anything of that sort, but rather so that we can learn from the mistakes and make the system work even better than it has. So uh, I appreciate having this hearing called, and I look forward to the testimony and discussion. And with that, I will yield back. I want to thank the gentleman uh, for his comments. And we'll begin with uh, Jay Egan, our CAO for the House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've submitted a full statement for the written record. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hoyer, members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here today to provide you information and answer your questions concerning the business continuity and disaster recovery program at the House of Representatives. The House has made great strides in proving our disaster preparedness and recovery capabilities, and I want to thank the numerous House staff who have worked tirelessly to achieve all that we have in the months that have passed since the events of last fall, and who continue to do so to help us accomplish our future goals. I am also most grateful for your assistance, Mr. Chairman, the support of our efforts, Mr. Hoyer, and that of the committee members, as well as the committee staff on both sides. We still have many challenges ahead of us, and I look forward to working with you in the committee in meeting them. With my testimony, I intend to, intend to cover uh, three topics, an, in, an overview of the business continuity and disaster recovery lessons learned, the actions taken to date in response to those lessons learned, and finally, plan capabilities that are scheduled for del delivery over the next year. The impact of September 11th and the anthrax attack on the House's ability to conduct its business were carefully evaluated, and the effectiveness of the immediate responses were assessed to see how improvements could be made in the event of a similar circumstance. The challenges experienced as a result of September 11th and the anthrax attack were classified into three solution areas, continuity of operations, communications, and technology and the following high-level lessons learned were developed. For continuity of operations, it's clear that we need to establish prearranged office facilities with the necessary infrastructure to enable short setup time when members, leadership, committees, and their staffs are unable to access current facilities. Second, that we need to create well-defined, coordinated, integrated, and expanded processes and procedures that are documented and regularly exercised and third, establish an off-site mail facility capable of handling mail and packages from the U.S. Postal Service as well as other shippers. For communications, it's evident that we need to have multiple methods of communication during and immediately following an emergency event, and that we need to test each of these solutions against the goal of providing members, the leadership committees, and their staffs with communications anywhere, anytime. 
with regard to technology we need to create a system wide off site redundancy with automatic failover capabilities to ensure that key systems and current data are available any time there is a failure at the house campus and finally ensure that off site capabilities are available to member office offices to afford them protection when their system fails or when they cannot access the system while they are dislocated from their current offices. Following September 11th, the House identified 27 initiatives to address near-term, mid-term, and long-term business continuity and disaster recovery needs. Following up on immediate responses to the anthrax attack, a formal business continuity and disaster recover, recovery program management office was established within the chief administrative officer. Through the efforts of this office, the initial 27 initiatives were restructured into 19 projects with specific goals and objectives that tie back to the lessons learned and their associated deficiencies in continuity of operations, communications, and technology. Further, the projects have a fully developed charter as well as an integrated budget and milestone schedule that focuses on delivering specific capabilities. I'm pleased to report that substantial and specific capabilities have been added in the three identified and identified solution areas. Under continuity operations, emergency preparation guidelines have been distributed to all offices. All emergency response personnel have been identified, and HORT house operations recovery drills are being conducted and lessons learned from each drill are being implemented. Second, complete office space assignments for the alternate house offices have been made. Interim computer network and telephone connectivity have been established, and notework, notebook computers and printers have been pre-configured and are pre-staged in storage for immediate support. Third, Funding and staffing to support 24-hour-a-day, 7-day-a-week operations have been approved, and hiring actions are underway in order to maintain and monitor critical house information systems as well as support the Emergency Communications Center. In the communications area, Blackberries were distributed to all members following September 11th. Government Emergency Telecommunications Services, or GETS, accounts have been established, and the cards have been delivered to all members. An emergency communications center has been integrated with house information resources operations. Included in the center is a direct line to the U.S. Capitol Police Command Headquarters as well as a BlackBerry member emergency notification capability and an automatic telephone dial-out emergency message notification capability for members. Under technology, dial-in and broadband remote access service ca services capacity has been doubled. An inbound fax system pilot is underway to test the viability of receiving and distributing faxes electronically as a potential means of reducing paper mail. Preparation for a digital mail pilot program is nearing completion. A diverse internet connection has been implemented to remove single points of failure. And we've been actively working with the legislative branch task force on selecting an alternative computer facility and alternative business center site. While considerable progress has been made to date, many additional business continuity and disaster recovery improvements are anticipated. Over the next year, for continuity of operations, we plan to complete a business continuity disaster recovery gap analysis and propose steps to close the gaps and to integrate and document all emergency response procedures to include finalizing procedures with the U.S. Capitol Police on near-term and long-term notification processes. We plan to extend hours for the House Information Resources Call Center, Emergency Communications Center, and Network Operations Center to 24 hours a day, seven days a week. For communications, we plan to procure and configure additional computer and office equipment to support mobile emergency response centers. We plan to finalize recommendations on procuring emergency communications vans and private cellular services to help overcome the access problems experienced with public cellular and dial-up service. And for technology, we plan to upgrade the WIP phone system to provide automated emergency notification capability, implement the alternative computer facility and alternative business center, and conduct simulated outage tests, and finally complete the digital mail pilot and implement the approved recommendations. Significant progress has been made since the initial response to September 11th and later to the anthrax attack, and the approved budget is sufficient to carry out the remainder of the initiatives under the Business Continuity and Disaster Recovery Program. Again, I want to thank all the members of the committee for your support and assistance over the last year, and I look forward to continuing to work with you, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I thank the gentleman for his testimony, and we'll move on to uh, the clerk of the House, Jeff Trandall, who had his early days uh, working with House administration. I don't know if that's positive or negative, but we like to think <laughs> it is. Very positive. Thank you, Mr. Um, clerk. Chairman A, Mr. Hoyer, and other distinguished members of the committee, I appreciate having this opportunity to provide the following testimony related to our preparedness activities following the terrorist attacks of September 11th 
in the anthrax emergency of October 2001. The events of September and October 2001 profoundly affected all Americans. For those of us who serve our nation's lawmakers in the U.S. House of Representatives, the terrorist actions of 2001 directly challenged our ability to discharge our duties and caused us to confirm our resolve to defend and protect this beloved institution. Since much of the remainder of that year has focused on the events and aftermath of September 11th and the October anthrax crises, my statement would not be complete without such recognition. Clearly, most of the operational activities and initiatives in which we were engaged are all well known to the Committee on House Administration and cannot properly be recounted in detail in this forum because of the obvious security reasons. I would, however, like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and honor the dedication of my staff, compliment and thank my fellow officers of the House, and recognize the unfailing support of the Committee on House Administration and the bipartisan House leadership along with the architect of the Capitol and the U.S. Capitol Police. Since my first association with this office in 1995 and through my subsequent election as clerk, I have been privileged to work with both and to lead a most exceptional group of people. The extent of that individual and corporate character that was clearly reviewed in the days following September 11th and throughout October's anthrax crises, working side by side for hours on end with talented staffs of the Sergeant at Arms, CAO, Architect, Police, and all the employees of the House. We put aside many distractions of that period to focus on the complex work at hand. With the support and encouragement of this committee, we found innovative ways to share our talents and knowledge with one another to ensure a continued operations of the House. What then were the lessons learned of the events of last year? Particularly following the evacuation of the Capitol complex, we learned then that we could provide the infrastructure to accommodate the House floor proceedings at an off-site location if it had been required and we were able to provide interim office operations to the many displaced members and committees of the House. That ability was made possible owing to a planning protocol my fellow officers and I instituted a year earlier through the support and guidance of this committee. We had a plan and we practiced it. We learned through those difficult events that our basic plan was sound. Unfortunately, it's real world experience that is often the best guide and teacher. We learned what worked we learned what did not and what more we needed to plan for. Now, one day short of the first anniversary of, the, of that terrible, tragic day, I can report to you, Mr. Chairman, that we are very prepared to respond decisively and effective, effectively should the operations of the House of Representatives be threatened again with serious disruption. Through the experience of those events and countless hours of planning and drilling, we can ensure that the House can convene meet and conduct House business under a variety of scenarios. More importantly, the House of Representatives, for the first time now, has a core professional group dedicated to ensuring the continued operations of the House. Through legislation enacted earlier this year, the Office of the House Office of Emergency Pro Planning, Preparedness and Operations was established to coordinate such continuity of operation requirements and better assist the House and the House officers in the planning and execution of their tasks in the event of an emergency. I appreciate the confidence of this committee placed in me and my fellow officers to help lay the groundwork for the eventual establishment of this office. On behalf of the House, Bill Livingwood, Jay, and I, we vetted numerous candidates for the director of this office, which resulted in the selection of Kurt Coughlin, formerly of the Department of Energy. Since his appointment earlier this year, Kurt has established a top-notch team of professionals who have already made significant contributions to our overall preparedness. Mr. Chairman, I know we all hope and pray that we will never again have to implement our emergency plans. If, however, we do, I can tell this committee now that the House of Representatives will not be prevented from conducting its business for the American people. I appreciate the attention of the Chairman and the committee and would be pleased to answer any questions. Appreciate the testimony of the clerk. And now we'll move on to our architect of the Capitol, uh, Alan Hantlin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Nay, Congressman Hoyer, Congressman Ehlers, uh, members of the committee. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to join with the House officers and with Chief Howe to come before your committee to share with you some of the significant efforts that have been made since September 11th in the areas of security and emergency preparedness. It's really hard to believe that a, virtually a full year has passed since the tragic events of September 11th, and those events that followed on with the anthrax contamination in October certainly compounded to change our lives forever. Security and emergency preparedness certainly became even higher priorities in the work of my office. 
In line with some of the comments that Congressman Hoyler, Hoyer and Congressman Ehlers said earlier, hundreds of employees worked around the clock to make sure that we recovered from these activities. Uh, the remediation and the evaluation of the anthrax uh, contamination in Longworth and Ford took hundreds and hundreds of hours, as well as the Hart Senate office building. People worked around the clock seven days a week. And uh, among the, some of the things that the AOC personnel were involved with was establishing the command center at the Botanic Gardens, virtually the only building that had not received mail on Capitol Hill and therefore was clean for the command center. Uh, manned the incident command center at the D Street operations, provided keys, access information, escorts, building floor plans, ventilation system information, assisted in the development of anthrax sampling plans with NIOSH. We also supplied logistical support, such as food, office supplies, equipment, whatever else was needed to support the Environmental Protection Agency and their efforts here as well. Among the small lessons learned, uh, a lot of our building plans were locked up in the Ford House office building, which was contaminated. So we now have multiple sets of plans at various locations so that we can have access to them in the event of an emergency at any, any particular location. Also over the last year, as any member can see as they come to vote at the Capitol, we've made tremendous progress on the Capitol Square Perimeter Security Program, which as you know was started before September 11th. The Southwest Drive has been completed and reopened. Work on the Southeast Drive began in May and it reopened yesterday. While the south entrance is still under construction, the structural components are in place and we're waiting to install the finished stonework in a manner that will not disrupt uh, congressional operations. The Library of Congress perimeter security improvements for the Thomas Jefferson and James Madison Memorial buildings are under construction. The installation of the vehicle barriers as part of our outer perimeter on Independence Avenue near 1st Street Southwest and near 2nd Street Southeast is underway and is very close to completion now. You're also, of course, very well aware of the construction of the Capitol Visitor Center. Although the CVC is not a direct result of 9-11, it was being planned well before that day, uh, the Visitor Center will add significant additional security to the complex by screening visitors a distance away from the building. As you all know, we've already constructed temporary screening facilities outside the north and south entrances to the Capitol as a threat reduction measure. In addition, the CVC will greatly improve the ability of the Capitol Police and the Capitol Guide Service to regulate and to respectfully manage the large flow of visitors to the Capitol, which will improve both security and safety for all. Further, the CVC also will facilitate evacuation out of the Capitol building if necessary. However, Mr. Chairman, there are many things that not, are not as quite as visible as the Visitor Center or the Perimeter Security Projects, and I'd like to just list a few of them for the committee now. Uh, emergency evacuation brochures were redesigned in conjunction with the Security Task Force to better uh, have evacuation instructions and diagrams for all. They were printed by GPO, distributed by the Capitol Police, and there have been training sessions on building evacuation procedures and two drills as well since then. In the Capitol, we added the capabilities of a public address system for voice notification during any emergency evacuations. In the House Office Building, systems already existed but were tested, and we're doing a study to identify design and construction costs to upgrade it. <coughs> We've purchased and installed replacements for both antiquated emergency generators, which were over 50 years old. They now have new state-of-the-art generators for better reliability during emergencies. Portable emergency generator was also purchased to provide emergency power on an as-needed basis. We've also purchased high-efficiency particulate air filter vacuums, HEPA vacuums, for our cleaning staff. My organization's also been an active participant in numerous HORT, which is House Office Recovery Team drills, to support planning for responses to emergency relocation of the House chamber or other facilities. Continued assistance to the Capitol Police and security upgrades throughout the complex has also been provided. Uh, for installation of permanent police podiums at building entrances and tunnels to the Capitol, installation of infrastructure for the interior access control systems, other security systems, building perimeter alarm installations, security camera installations, uh, all of these issues, as well as the uh, shadow-resistant window film that's been installed in all of our buildings. As the committee can see, Mr. Chairman, my office, in conjunction with all the witnesses sitting before you today, has made significant advances since September 11th. I can't say enough about the work of all of these folks and of the staff that uh, I have the honor to lead. They've accomplished all these things while continuing to maintain their normal day-to-day -day operations that existed before 9-11, and we still have a lot of work to do. 
including continuing to uh, secure the Capitol Hill perimeter in a sensitive and respectful way, uh, to continue our master planning efforts regarding parking and other issues that we can talk about later as well. A lot of work still remains to be done, but I'm confident that we will continue to work com uh, cooperatively with pride and with diligence towards achieving these goals, and I look forward to further discussion on these and other subjects. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank the uh, architect of the Capitol for, uh, for your statement. And uh, we have uh, Carrie Hanley, uh, Deputy Sergeant of Arms, is here, and we appreciate all her work. And Mr. Living Goods arrived, the Sergeant of Arms. <laughs> we appreciate <Lucky> me. <laughs> Carrie. Uh, <laughs> I should also note that Carrie, Carrie is a new mom, and we congratulate you on that. Terry is now the happiest person in the hearing room. <laughs> <laughs> With that, we'll move on to, uh, if you're living good, our Sergeant of Arms, Bill. Mr. Chairman, ranking member, members, uh, I'm pleased to appear before you today to discuss the enhancements that have been made to security within the Capitol complex following the terrorist attacks, attack of September 11th, 2001. No single event has impacted security of the Capitol and the House and office buildings more than the events of September 11th. We have been challenged many times in the past. The bombings that occurred in the Capitol in 1915, 1971 and 1983. The shootings that occurred in 1954 and 1998. And the bioterrorism attack that occurred in October of 2001. All had lasting effects on the level of security needed to protect the legislative branch of the government. Likewise, terrorist events that occur outside the Capitol complex also cause us to review our security posture and apply lessons learned so that we may deter similar attacks at the Capitol. It is clear from our history that the Capitol is a tempting target for terrorists and those who seek to disrupt the legislative process or strike a symbolic blow against the United States. We have long believed that the ultimate destination of Flight 93, whose heroic passengers, and I say heroic passengers, forced down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, that plane, the destination we feel was the United States Capitol, and recent supports are supporting that premise. We do not know, we do know that the terrorists who hijacked the plane asked for clearance into Reagan National uh, Airport. We also know that terrorists, terrorists choose targets based on certain criteria, such as symbolism, mass casualties, and high likelihood of success. It is our responsibility to take every reasonable and prudent precaution that we can to remove the terrorist likelihood of success with regard to the Capitol, the House, and Senate office buildings, and those that work and visit within the Capitol complex. To that end, immediately following the September attacks, the United States Capitol Police Board directed that a comprehensive security survey of the Capitol complex be conducted by the Thre Defense Threat Reduction Agency, DITRA. The resulting DITRA report, combined with the earlier U.S. Capitol, uh, U.S. Secret Service, and other security and law enforcement agencies in this country, security surveys, provided us with a roadmap to enhance security and address vulnerabilities. We did that and have been doing it all along. The following security enhancements have been made in the aftermath 
of the September 11, 2001 attacks. We have amended the traffic regulations for the Capitol complex, rerouted trucks around uh, the Capitol complex, installed additional vehicular barriers around Capitol Square and the House office buildings, closed streets around the House office buildings, denied pedestrian entrances to our and access to our building office garages, continued our critical incident command group evaluations, I'm sorry, evacuations for the year, which consisted of a minimum of three drills per building. The evacuation drills were both announced and unannounced. Updated the Capitol and House Office Building Emergency Preparedness Plan. We've conducted tabletop exercises on evacuation of the buildings and chamber. We've developed new and additional evacuation plans. We've developed and are implementing fire drills on a regular scheduled and unscheduled basis. We restricted bicycle traffic on Capitol Square. We have examined the needs and recommended what to have in safe kits and use of escape masks. We've procured additional escape masks. We've trained over 6,000 House members and staff on escape masks. We developed and implemented new screening procedures with the Chief Administrative Officer. We've developed new guidelines for tours of the Capitol. We've also increased the size of tour groups after we had stopped tours uh, while still maintaining security and good security. We've developed guidelines for staff-led tours. We've deployed blocking vehicles and devices around the Capitol Square and the House office buildings. We've replaced some of the, all of the inadequate concrete planters that were around Capitol Square and were cracking with the architect. We've utilized the D.C. National Guard for supplemental security staffing. We've staffed the Critical Incident Command Center for six months after the anthrax attack. We have developed and implemented a tactical training program. We now have, thanks to the Congress of the United States, a training academy and facility at Sheltingham, Maryland, which for the Capitol Police will be operational this October 1st and will accommodate all Capitol Police recruit, academy training, as well as Capitol Police in-service training programs for Capitol Police employees. In addition, we plan on having tactical training at that location. Sheltingham will have three full-size classrooms, one 54-person auditorium-style classroom and two 24-person classrooms. The facility will house the staff offices of the Training Services Bureau of the Capitol Police, a fitness center for the students and officers, a defensive tactics mat room, and a computer lab. We have designed an initial security plan for the Capitol Visitor Center. We've developed a construction security program and security system for the CVC construction site that's ongoing now. Since 9-11, we've hired approximately 210 officers, which Chief Howe will allude to or talk to, and additional 14 are scheduled for appointment in September. While we have made significant physical and operational improvements, as we all know, the backbone of our security is the men and women of the United States Capitol Police. Nothing in the history of Congress has challenged our police personnel more than the September 11 attacks and the subsequent anthrax attack. Security was raised to an unprecedented level in order to protect the Capitol 
the Congress, and the national legislative process. Our personnel were required to work additional duty hours for an extended period of time under stressful conditions. They, the Capitol Police officers, put their personal lives on hold in order to meet their professional responsibilities. They prove once again that there are, they are the thin blue line which protects us all from harm and allows the Capitol to function in a safe and secure environment. I thank them personally and for all of us for their dedication, service, and sacrifice. I am proud to be associated with such a fine group of men and women, and I am honored to serve you and to serve with them. Thank you for, your opportunity, for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I thank you for all your help and assistance to this complex, to the Capitol, to my office, to the Capitol Police. You made all of our work possible, and I thank each and every one of you for that. And I'll be happy to answer questions at any time. I want to thank the Sergeant of Arms for his testimony. I also would point out uh, we've been joined by Congressman Fata and Doolittle, uh, two uh, tremendous members of this committee who, along with their staffs, have uh, made uh, this past uh, difficult year uh, uh, a working uh, good relationship, and we appreciate both of them for that. And we'll move on to the last witness, and if you either gentleman have a statement, we'll entertain at that time. And uh, we have now uh, Robert Howe, the Assistant Chief of Police, United States Capitol Police. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I am pleased to appear before you today to discuss the impact of the terrorist attacks of September 11 had on operations and personnel of the United States Capitol Police. On September 11, 2001, the United States Capitol Police evacuated the Capitol and all the House and Senate office buildings simultaneously for the first time in history. From that point forward, the department was placed at the highest level of alert. The response required to protect the Capitol, the Congress, those who work and visit within the Capitol complex, and the legislative process in the wake of the attacks placed a strain on all of our personnel. All of our officers and civilian support personnel worked extended duty hours and made personal sacrifices in order to meet the challenges before us. Officers were working 12 to 16 hour tours of duty with no or few days off. Leave was suspended and many officers canceled their scheduled vacations. This level of effort continued through the anthrax attack and into April of 2002. Under extremely difficult circumstances, our personnel once again answered the call to duty and took extraordinary efforts to protect our community. They do this day in and day out with the knowledge that protecting Congress, its staff, visitors, and these buildings against those who are intent on committing acts of violence is in the interest of our nation. However, the attacks of 9-11 and subsequent anthrax attacks underscored the fact that the United States Capitol Police is understaffed given the importance and diversity of our mission. Securing the Capitol complex and ensuring the national legislative process can proceed unhindered is a daunting task. It is also very labor intensive. Following 9-11, we conducted an extensive review of our staffing requirements. We determined that in order to meet all of our responsibilities and allow for the required training of our personnel, <clears throat> an optimum staffing level of 1,981 officers was required. This figure is a goal we hope to reach by fiscal year 04. It should be noted that we are losing officers to other agencies at an increasing rate. Likewise, we are competing against those same agencies to a, a track qualified applicants in order to increase our staffing level and overcome attrition. Attrition primarily driven by losses to the Transportation Security Administration and other law enforcement agencies is expected to continue at a high rate for the near term. The department is projecting a fiscal year 03 attrition rate of approximately 12 and one half percent and an FY04 attrition rate of approximately seven and a half percent. We have set a, aggressive recruiting goals over the next two years. I am confident that the recent pay adjustments supported by this committee 
combined with recruiting and retention incentives will help us to remain competitive in the market and allow us to attract and retain highly, highly qualified personnel. The current staffing level has also had a detrimental effect on our training initiatives. The capability of any organization is dependent on the level of training, knowledge, and skill of its personnel. This is why we have made training a priority in the coming year, especially in light of September 11th and the October 15th attacks. Our personnel at all levels must receive intensive, realistic, and demanding training that supports our mission. Because we have public safety responsibilities, we must ensure our sworn and civilian personnel are capable of performing their duties at peak effectiveness. The training facility at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Sheltonham, Maryland, will significantly improve our training and education program. We will be able to conduct all of our training functions, including counter assault, emergency vehicle operations, firearms, and general classroom instruction at that state-of-the-art facility. Moreover, as we increase our staffing levels, we will be able to pull officers off the line to receive the level of training required to operate in this new threat environment. I want to thank the committee for the support and guidance you have provided to the United States Capitol Police, especially over the past year. We have met and discussed the concerns of the committees of jurisdiction regarding how to best protect against the very threats and security concerns we face. We will continue to build upon those initiatives we've begun concerning risk management, security, and law enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Chief Howe, and also, you know, uh, thank you, uh, the management and also the rank and file of the Capitol Hill Police. With that, uh, I'd entertain if uh, Mr. Doolittle has a statement. Uh. I, I have no statement, Mr. Chairman, except to thank the officers and officials before us for the outstanding work they've been doing. Thank you. Mr. Fatah? I have no statement at this time, and I join in uh, uh, my colleague's statement. Thank you. And with that, we'll open up to, to questions. Uh, are you my question time, uh, Mr. Hoyer? Uh, Mr. Egan, uh, as, as I understand it, you have notebook computers and printers stored and pre-configured for use in the event of another anthrax attack, where members be out of their offices, not have access to their computers. What's the plan for maintaining uh, the current equipment? And how will you replace this equipment? What will happen to the old equipment? Uh, we have a phasing plan where at different periods of time on a three to five year schedule, we'll take PCs and cycle them out. In those cases where we can put them into house inventory, whether within the officer's structures or offered them to members' offices, we will do so. So for the most part, uh, we will have an inventory that is uh, uh, fairly up to date. That is the objective, yes. Now, Blackberries, as all of us know, are the preferred uh, uh, mode of communicating with members in the event of an emergency. And I might say right now, uh, the chairman refers to, I don't want to bring levity into a hearing that's very serious, but the chairman refers to his blackberry as his crackberry because he's addicted to it. I see the, chairman, <laughs> see the chairman with his blackberry all the time. And uh, uh, he uh, obviously has found it useful. But the chairman's uh, initiative, which I obviously supported strongly, but uh, members have found that to be extraordinarily helpful. And in light of what happened on September 11th, where members felt disconnected and went out in the street they, they didn't know where to go. Their staffs didn't know where to go. Everybody was disconnected. And members, of course, felt a responsibility to be ready to respond to whatever the emergency required, but they felt out of touch. The Blackberries, which the chairman and this committee provided to members without cost of their uh, members' representation allowance, uh, have proved very, very helpful. The question is this. With the end of the service contract for the Blackberry arriving in October 2002, uh, what are your plans for the renewal of service for the member, members' distributed units? Right, the original commitment for the program had to be had been that it would be a uh, one-year house-funded undertaking. But with the popularity and the success that's been um, accompanying their deployment, as you recognized, uh, we're looking at uh, finding the funds to fund it for a second year to continue the program as an enterprise undertaking. Good. I, I think that's a an institutional responsibility and critical for the institution to function in the times of an emergency. 
And I think just uh, to add on to that, I think we would, during the next year, also start to look at the next generation of successors. Um, we had an opportunity to have a demonstration of a new technology called Tablet PC that is uh, coming down the line this fall. And uh, if people were impressed with, impressed with Blackberries, their socks are going to be knocked off when they see uh, <laughs> this particular undertaking. So. Uh, I think to use the next year as uh, an opportunity both for kind of business, normal business purposes and an emergency, it'll be a good time to us to evaluate what's the next generation for the House. If it is more riveting than the BlackBerry, perhaps we can keep it away from the chairman. <laughs> 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 last question, Mr. Chairman. I've got a lot of questions, but the last question I'll ask on this rim. The House has a system called uh, Dialogic, which will automatically call designated numbers in an emergency and broadcast a recorded message. Uh, the uh, Chief Administrative Officer has not developed a plan, however, as I understand it, for calling members on cell phones or home phones. Uh, what is the strategy that's going to uh, be? Actually, no. Uh, the Dialogic system is a system that is, is being installed right now as a replacement for the current WIP system. The WIP system is probably about 10 to 15 years old. We did a survey of members' offices to find out the usage and found out that it was fairly weak in, on both sides of the aisle and proposed and have had funded a replacement called the Dialogic. Um, the Dialogic that exists today is actually under the Capitol Police control, but relatively speaking, it's a very, it's a very small system. And the Dialogic that the House has acquired is, uh, has the ability to simultaneously dial, I think, 644 telephone calls at the same time. Um, and it has the uh, memory capability to recognize multiple contact numbers for uh, members or others that are put on the list. And the way the system works is it starts with kind of the first number and goes to the second until it gets a positive solution. So when I talked about in our lessons learned that we needed to have multiple means of communication, what I meant by that was we need to have ways where we can reach you because you're carrying a device like a BlackBerry or your pager or alternatively um, call you somehow or alternatively have a way where you can reach us via the telephone system like the Getz card. So the Dialogic is one of those range of solutions and it does have the capability to dial multiple numbers. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I would note on those Blackberries, we want to thank Mr. Egan. We usurped his budget with his permission to pay for them. My wife is personally happy they don't work in St. Clairsburg, where we live. <laughs> and the reason I'm so sold on them, actually, Mr. Hoyer, is the only thing they've ever been able to taught me to run technologically in the last eight years. <laughs> That's why I'm there. Good for you. Uh, we've been joined also by Mr. Micah, Florida. Mr. Ailey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, continuing on the Blackberry uh, issue. Uh, there's one problem with it, and the chairman just alluded to that. Uh, we have great difficulty receiving messages in our home districts. And I, I uh, hope you will investigate ways of handling that problem in some way. Also, I wanted to comment that it, it takes a lot to knock my socks off, and I don't think the tablet PDA will do it. Uh, what would probably come close to it, or is uh, something that's in the pipeline, and I don't know when it'll get here, but I hope we can implement that, which basically combines the BlackBerry, in other words, the email facility, uh, the paging, and the cell phone. And that would be marvelous, since right now I'm carrying three pieces of electronics on my belt. I feel like a police officer walking around with all that equipment hanging on. Uh, we'll either have to come up with something that's combined or you're going to have to requisition stronger belts to, to be able to carry all this. So I hope you'll keep on top of that. And, and uh, But the BlackBerry reception uh, away from Washington is a, is a real problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I miss a lot of notices as a result of that. The uh, other issue of communications, which still bothers me tremendously, and that has nothing to do with emergency communications, but it has a great deal to do with the ongoing operation of the Congress, and that is mail. We still have not solved our mail problems. I know that much of that is out, out of your control, uh, but uh, steadily improving, but it still leaves much to be desired. And it's very frustrating to receive invitations to meetings after the meeting is over. And that's just one example. 
so i i hope we uh, collectively can work on that problem and come up with some solutions too uh, mr chairman i also like to question some of the other members mr living good you, you most of your testimony you discussed changes made uh, to the security involving the Capitol Police. Uh, I didn't catch anything that you've done involving your specific responsibilities that only you have, and that is your sergeant at arms employees. Uh, uh, can you give a brief review? I'll be glad to do that in a closed hearing, sir. All right, fine. And uh, Mr. Howe, I noticed that you said that we're supposed to give 1,981 FTEs by fiscal year 04. Have those been approved, and if so, by whom? I thought this was the authorizing committee for that, and uh, that's news to me. Uh, Mr. Ehlers, I, I believe the committee has a, uh, a bill that has cleared the committee and cleared the House, is pre presently pending before the Senate that authorizes that level. At that level? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Okay, I missed that one, and I shouldn't have. Uh, what are you doing for training, training the, the, your uh, staff? your officers in dealing with bioterrorism. I know a lot of mistakes are dealing with the anthrax, but uh, there are, we can expect that to be repeated or alternative biological uh, agents being distributed. What about chemical? And what about nuclear? Uh, do you have any means of detecting radiation in case someone decides to disperse radioactive materials around the Capitol? We do have those capabilities, Mr. Ehlers, and I can, I can get into those in more detail with you in, in the uh, executive session. But late last year, the, uh, in the emergency supplemental, the Congress authorized the establishment of a uh, chemical biological strike team uh, on the Capitol Police. And we currently have applications under review to hire 60 individuals to staff this strike team. We expect it to be online uh, by early November. Uh, it'll be 60 individuals specifically dedicated to uh, the detection, mitigation, and uh, cleanup of chemical biological incidents. They're well trained. I'm told that many of our applicants are uh, currently members of the the Marine Corps Chemical Biological Incident uh, Response Force for leaving the military. So I, th I think we'll be able to put together an excellent team of individuals to handle uh, just exactly that concern. I'm, I'm primarily concerned about the first responders and that they handle it properly, which means training all of your officers in what to do in the first response to avoid tracking biologicals around uh, to knowing when to evacuate employees, when to seal off offices, turn Each, off ventilation systems, and so forth. We have, we have learned uh, a considerable amount, especially from the October 16th attack. Prior to that, we had been training all of our officers in, in what we call within the organization Alert One, which is a, a familiarity level with chemicals and, and biological materials and some nuclear materials. An additional cadre of probably 200 to 250 of our officers were trained to what we call an alert two level. And alert two was how to evacuate other people, uh, decontaminate individuals, and, and uh, that sort of thing. Each of our officers are, receives at a minimum, each of our employees, including civilian employees, excuse me, receives at a minimum awareness level training uh, on an annual basis. You know, back the balance of my time. Thank you. Um, Mr. Patak? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me ask, uh, I, 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 I probably prefer to wait till we go in a closed session. Thank you. Mr. Micah? Thank you. Um, appreciate your holding this important hearing, Mr. Chairman. A uh, couple of things. Um, just from a practical st standpoint, you said you have a uh, you have a system in place that will well, that will dial automatically 644 numbers. One of the problems I have, and I've got my cell phone with me, I used to be in the cell business, and uh, I travel around the Capitol grounds here, and I still can't get uh, reception in certain areas. It's not 
very difficult to get these antennas out. I mean, they're, today we, we should be able to have antennas uh, throughout the place and be Somebody's able to... Somebody's testing the system, apparently. <laughs> yeah. uh, we can get it in this room, but I can show you a lot of places where there are dead zones here. It's not technically that difficult, but it's nice to dial 644 numbers, but if nobody can get the uh, a response at the other end, I think we need to, uh, to make sure that that's in place. I'd spoken to the architect, too, about, um, well, first of all, I believe that the United States Capitol building is still a target. I think that terrorists, uh, uh, if they took eight years to, uh, from 1993 to two September 2001 to go after the World Trade Center, uh, I feel that uh, the most enduring symbol of our whole nation is the Capitol building. I think they didn't get it last time. I, I believe that they're, uh, they will come back after us. Um, that's unfortunate, but uh, folks, we just have to learn by our experience, and that was a, a very tough lesson, which we'll remember tomorrow. In that regard, I think we have a responsibility to safeguard uh, and save as much of the capital as we can if it is hit. And I don't know if a study has been done yet to see what, uh, uh, and I know some studies have been done, I should correct that, to see what certain explosive devices will do, and I know some of those uh, protections have been incorporated into the visitor center. But I think that uh, we need to look uh, even further than that. One of the things I've asked the architect's office to do, and I'll ask on the record again, uh, as chairman of aviation, I've seen equipment that will, uh, will disperse an incredible volume of uh, foam. Uh, uh, most of the... Uh, millions of tens of millions of dollars we're putting in fire extinguisher systems which needs to be done for fire purposes throughout the capital uh, most of that equipment will not do anything with the kind of terrorist attack that we've already seen uh, I want to report back on the specific equipment that will uh, disperse uh, uh, protective uh, substance uh, and save as much of the Capitol building if, as possible if we're hit with an explos explosive device or we're hit with a plane that's uh, loaded with fuel. So um, I'd, uh, I've asked for that. I haven't received it, and I expect a response on that at some point. And while we've got the, the uh, plaza dug up, it's a perfect time to fill one of those extra holes and spaces with uh, uh, that equipment. And I think it will work. I'm not positive. I, I've been involved with some uh, construction projects and development projects on the outside, but uh, I have every reason to believe that it would offer us some backup protection at very little expense to save as much of the, uh, the national treasures and, and the building as possible. The other thing, a simple thing, is evacuation route. Uh, I come from Florida, and we have uh, hurricanes down there, and that's our threat. So, We've also had wildfires and other types of natural disasters. And we do have posted evacuation routes. I have not seen, nor would I even know, how we would get out of this place again. I remember one year ago, uh, tomorrow, the, the chaos that ensued, uh, cars backed up, people getting out of here. Now, uh, we should at least have an, a, a posted evacuation route on the routes leaving the Capitol building. Uh, and that's going to be very difficult now that we've got these uh, concrete barriers. Uh, if we have to get out of here, and, and you know, I'm not talking about the members, but the staff uh, and, and others, but there should be posted uh, in the district, at least from uh, the federal buildings, um, we turn that traffic all into one way uh, or uh, some plan. And I've not seen that. I think we need that, again, just a practical uh, uh, system. The other thing that disturbs me, and I can go into it in the uh, closed session, is I don't see uh, the deployment of what I consider the latest technology of uh, uh, explosive detection devices and equipment. Um, we can talk about that more uh, in closed session. But I think we're still at risk in people bringing, uh, uh, I was told, you know, the, the, the explosive material that Richard Reed had in his shoe would have taken out the side of that, that uh, plane. 
uh, it's not easy. It's not that easy or difficult to still get a s explosives the size of a backpack or uh, a significant uh, size of a package into the capital uh, in strategic locations to do an uh, incredible amount of damage. And I still don't see in place uh, um, the equipment that w I believe we should have uh, in place uh, for some screening on the per uh, at least on the perimeters. Uh, uh, so those are some of my concerns, uh, the explosive detection portion we might want to talk about in closed session. Doesn't anyone care to respond? We will certainly get back to you on those, uh, those items, uh, uh, Congressman. Uh, certainly with respect to the foam and the evacuation issues, uh, we will certainly address that. And in closed session, we can talk about the uh, uh, explosive detective systems. On the uh, traffic evacuation routes, we have noticed the same. You are exactly correct. We have been working just recently with the D.C. government on this for us and for others. And we will be posting in each office traffic evacuation okay. routes. It's not just posting in the office, and I think that's important. That's our responsibility and shame on us right. if we haven't done that. But also, I mean, uh, it doesn't take that much to get a sign uh, that this is the evacuation. Uh, it's, it's a combination of things, Congressman. I, I think uh, additionally, Originally, our pay was a bit lower than theirs, and I think originally the Transportation Security Administration was, you know, at the risk of criticizing a sister agency, was sort of gold plating some of the jobs uh, that they were handing out. I think they've ceased doing that. We're seeing the attrition levels slow down. Uh, the committees have authorized a, a 5 percent pay increase for our officers this coming year. Uh, coupled with the cost of living increase, I, I think will be very competitive uh, with similarly situated agencies. What about the the hours? I know talking to some of the officers, they were working. Uh, it seems like it was like six days a week for six 14 months. hours a day or something. It mm -hmm. was uh, pretty bad. Has that uh, improved? Uh, that has. That has decreased as well. Beginning in April, we started bringing our officers as best we could back to a five-day week. Uh, some of them are still working pretty long hours, some 12-hour days uh, and things of that nature. But as we hire people uh, and get those people on the line, that decreases for everybody. So, that's so things are, are improving, in your opinion? Rapidly, as a matter of fact. I, I think things will be a lot better in, in just a few short months. We expect to graduate another 122 officers before the end of this calendar year. Uh, I think things will get better quite quickly. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Egan, I join with my colleagues and my enthusiasm for the BlackBerry. And However, I'm also glad you're monitoring the, the new technologies because there's always something better coming along. One thing that I've learned about that sounds pretty good is the handspring, which apparently combines at least the the email function and the cellular telephone function. I don't know about the pager function. Maybe that's in there too. But um, you know, I'd appreciate your because that's a nice small thing. I don't know how big this tablet thing is you're talking about. Is that about the same size as the BlackBerry? No, the uh, tablet PC is more about the size of this piece of paper. Okay. Well, I've heard of those, and those, those sound very interesting, but one of the great features of the BlackBerry is the size. Right. And we did see demonstrations of kind of the next generation of both cellular phones that are integrated with uh, Palm and BlackBerry and Handspring kind of technology, and then we also saw Blackberries and those kinds of devices that had a phone integrated. Um, they don't seem to be all the way there to the ideal thing. For example, in the one we saw of a, uh, a BlackBerry-type device, it's kind of a flip-up phone, but of course, as soon as you start talking on the phone, you can't see the BlackBerry anymore. And then conversely, we saw ones that, um, that didn't use the flip open phone, but the way to connect to it is an earplug. And that seems to be something that people either really like or they really hate. Um, so it looks like they're getting close, but uh, they haven't quite hit the home run yet. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, thank the you, gentleman yield just yeah, a second. Yeah, I'll yield. I, uh, I asked some critical questions. Uh, they didn't mean, I didn't mean to be critical, but I just want to say one thing to uh, uh, our sergeant at arms and acting chief. Uh, participated in some memorial services at home this weekend. One of the things that I remembered and I told the crowd was 
when I left here, I came back from the Pentagon. I was at a meeting at the Pentagon and just missed by a few minutes being at the Pentagon to get here in time to see the, the Pentagon actually hit. But I, I told the crowd, I, I'll never forget an officer coming down the hall saying, Mr. Micah, my wife was with me, Mrs. Micah, you've got to leave. We think another plane is headed for the Capitol building. And I remembered those, those people, I want you to know. And then we started out, we got out in our car and we tried to go up Pennsylvania Avenue, which was the closest route. And there was a female officer and she stood there and said, Mr. Micah, Congressman, don't go up that way because we're, we're convinced a plane is headed here and you'll be at risk. When my wife and I got back, we thought, oh my God, those people are back there. Uh, and, w you know, w one thing we haven't done, I don't know if we did it, uh, we should have a resolution to commend uh, those people who acted so heroically that day. They stayed behind uh, when, we, when, we, they, when they uh, provided uh, escape and, uh, and, and, and tried to help us get away from here because everyone knows it was organized, uh, disorganized confusion. But you go back and tell those folks we appreciate it and maybe we could do a resolution to uh, commend them because uh, they were here knowing that they, 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 they were uh, standing in what might have been a uh, target except for a few brave people on an uh, aircraft in Pennsylvania. We will tell them that. Thank you, Micah. Thank uh, you for yielding. If I could, just to reiterate, and I've talked about it once before and it's, it's a very uh, subject that's very close to my heart and an emotional subject. That day, on the 11th, after the Capitol Police had cleared the building, the House and uh, particularly the, I was at the Capitol, so the Capitol building, and we did a last minute walk through. They were at the doors, there were three of them there, a lieutenant and two officers. And they said to me, Mr. Livingood, we will man these doors no matter what, unless you tell us not to. And they knew at that time they thought a plane was coming but they were willing to stay at that door no matter what i think that speaks volumes any other uh, question uh, one thing i'd want to comment on the communications uh after 911 occurred and the capitol was evacuated as you know the congress you know went uh, back to do its its business yeah, but the one overwhelming theme I heard and it's been raised today, but it was communications also. Members of the House were worried about to make sure proper security was here for staff, to make sure the Capitol remained open, to be cautious but calm, have security but have people's house open. And I believe we've, we've all accomplished that. But the communications it was the one item, and I don't know what technologically comes down the pike soon to have, you know, a, a system that will be good and will work extensively, but communication was the one part of it. That's why I supported Congressman Langevin's uh, study uh, that uh, looks at, uh, uh, does a proper study look at, at communications and how we can uh, function as a Congress because the people have elected members and during a crisis they want those members to be able to communicate and the government extends beyond one, two, or eight people. And so uh, that was, I think, another lesson we learned was the communications. And I know we've got ideas are out there, and we have to continue on that very diligently as much as we can uh, so that the members uh, during a crisis will be able to communicate no matter where we're at and be, be available for votes or whatever official business we have to do. So I think that's going to be a, something we've got to press to the wall to continue. Are there further questions? Mr. Chairman, I, I presume sure. we're about to go into executive session, but before we do, I want to uh, thank you. Uh, I've worked with the uh, uh, assistant chief and the chief and his predecessor uh, over the last, I guess, three or four years because I have been very concerned about the FTE level of our police officers. Uh, both before and certainly after uh, office, uh, Officer Chestnut and uh, Officer Gibson lost uh, their lives. I was very concerned about the number of people that we had on doors through which hundreds of people come, mostly tourists, uh, mostly somewhat disorganized and sort of interested in saying, which is what we want them to be, uh, but very difficult for the officers to, uh, uh, to deal with in a secure way. Uh, you were critical, and this committee was critical, 
in supporting uh, efforts and uh, uh, giving us a consensus on the Legislative Appropriations Committee to fund the level that uh, the chief, the acting chief, uh, has said was necessary somewhere in the neighborhood of between 1,900 and 2,000 officers, uh, which are, I guess, about chief, what, about 1,650 uniformed and about 350 non-uniformed personnel. Very close, Mr. Yeah. Uh, but your efforts on that were critical, and uh, we've, we've, we've had difficulty. But I think everybody now in the Congress understands that it's easy to make some sort of analysis that, well, a city of X thousands has only a police force of 500 people or 400 people. But I think Mr. Micah is absolutely correct. I can't believe that there is a higher priority target than the capital of the United States. Uh, and there's no doubt in my mind that the plane that went down in Pennsylvania was going for the dome. The White House is down in the trees. It's hard to see. Uh, it would be difficult to, frankly, get into. Uh, but had they been able to take off the dome of the Capitol, that would have been a stark picture in the minds of every citizen of the world, because that is a symbol of the freest nation uh, and, the free, and, and the symbol of democracy in the world, not just in this country. Uh, and therefore, Chief, it, um, Mr. Ney, as you know, was critically important in getting the kind of support we needed to make sure that we had the complement. Uh, and we need to get that, we need to get you up to that FTE level as quickly as we can, as quickly as we can get recruits through. Uh, I have expressed concern, others have expressed concern about the TSA's uh, competition because of the disparity of pay and uh, uh, other aspects of the job, including hours. I think you're right. I think that's evening out somewhat now. Uh, but uh, I think it's critically important that this committee was supportive of the levels that we need, given the complexity uh, of the job of protecting the physical uh, being of the Capitol and the, not just the thousands of people who work here, but the millions of people from this country, citizens, and also uh, hundreds of thousands of people from uh, other countries who visit this Capitol. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions or, or comments? Um, let me just uh, say in conclusion before we uh, entertain a motion, I just want to thank all of you today for your uh, time that you've made available to the committee. I want to thank uh, all of you personally. Uh, we watched you behind closed doors. Uh, you had the integrity we needed. Uh, truly cared about all the people that work in this complex. We saw that. Uh, it was honest emotion and uh, concern for the lives of uh, thousands of people and also your desire to keep pushing on to uh, keep People's House open, and all of your staff, and all of the staff of the House and the Senate. You know, people, people talk about uh, lack of uh, heroes today, but in my mind, uh, the people I saw, staff and personal officers, committee, yourself, uh, officers of the House uh, staff, uh, they had a desire and dedication to make sure that uh, this system continued, which the evil uh, that has been after this country wants it to stop. And I just want to commend everybody for a, a tremendous job. I think that there are many, many heroes in this building. And uh, we remember today all the people that have lost their lives. And we appreciate and I think that their families want uh, our system to continue versus the alternative that's tried to stop our, our way of life. So I commend all of you and your staff for doing that. Uh, we've now reached a point in the hearing where we'd like to give both members and witnesses an opportunity to discuss issues with sensitive security implications. As a result, I'll entertain a motion to close and proceed in executive session. So moved. I wouldn't, well, thank you. I just want to note it's rare committee proceeds in a manner, but we appreciate it. So it's been moved by um, uh, Mr. Vata, and uh, at that point, uh, we'll ask for a recorded vote on the motion. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Ehlers? Yes. Mr. Ehlers votes aye. Mr. Micah? Aye. Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Linder? Mr. Doolittle? Aye. Mr. Doolittle votes aye. Mr. Reynolds? Mr. Hoyer? Aye. Mr. Hoyer votes aye. Mr. Pata? Aye. Mr. Pata votes aye. Mr. Davis? And Chairman Day? Aye. 
Chairman, nay votes aye. Um, we have six ayes, no nays. The motion is agreed to in the committee now stands executive session. Only members, officers, and pre-designated committee staff uh, shall remain present for the portion of the committee meeting. Uh, the committee will now stand in recess for five minutes. Thank you. Coming up on C-SPAN 2 this morning, a hearing on Iraqi weapons capabilities.